Well, she's wisdom and she's beautiful. And that's the only thing the philosopher is attracted to, wisdom. That's the most beautiful thing. All right. So then what defines, that's the soul of a philosopher. It's called philosophic eros. Let me throw this word up on the board. Eros. What does eros mean? Desire. Longing. And what does a philosopher desire, long for? Wisdom. And what is wisdom? Truth, beauty, goodness itself. That's wisdom. That's divine. Knowledge of divine things. All right. So, <clears throat> eros is an intense, intense desire and longing for the most beautiful thing. And what is the most beautiful thing? Truth. And if you arrive at truth, that's wisdom. Okay, that's a philosopher. So then what defines the noble class, the aristocracy? They don't love truth. They don't love wisdom. They don't, because that's the highest human type, is in love with truth and beauty and wisdom and goodness and justice. What defines the noble class, the aristocracy? Oh, they're defined by love, all right. They're defined by two loves. They love learning. Aristocracy, because liberal arts education is about love of learning. Ooh, and if you love learning, you also love something else. You love God. So liberal arts, and that's why Christians grab a hold of liberal arts education, because liberal arts education is about loving two things, loving learning and loving God. They go hand in hand. Okay. But what defines a noble class? They're not just defined by love of learning and love of God. What are they defined by? Oh, and this is what I want to talk about. The second highest human type is defined by something very powerful. The love of victory. Now, why do they love victory? So they're the noble class. They're the ruling class. They're the aristocracy. They rule the best. And what defines the best? They love one thing. Victory. And why do they love victory? Because what comes with victory? Glory. Honor comes from victory. Human greatness is defined by victory. So what defines the philosopher? Love of learning, love of wisdom. What defines aristocracy? Love of victory. Because what comes from victory? Glory and honor. Ooh, okay. Now comes the next regime. So that's number one. So first regime is monarchy or kingship, rule of one. A ruling alongside the best, which is the aristocracy. The next best regime, this is what I want to focus on, is a timocracy. Okay, we're going to talk about that one. In fact, I'm going to give you all five. So number two is a timocracy. Number three is an oligarchy. Uh, let's talk about oligarchy quickly. Oligarchy means the rule of the few. And what defines the rule of the few? It's the rule of the rich. So... In an oligarchy, those who have power, they love one thing, money. And they rule because money is power and power comes from money and they love money. They love property, they love their possessions. Now I'm going to jump back to Socrates. What does Socrates think of money and possessions? It's too expensive because it's going to cost you your soul. Okay. So that's why it's the third regime. Because it produces the third worst human type. Love of money, love of property. Now what's below oligarchy? Democracy. Okay? What's a democracy? The rule of the demos. Who are the demos? The vulgar many. And what do they love? Do they love money? Do they love wisdom? Do they love learning? Love of God? No, they just love freedom and they love their equality. That's why it's the fourth worst regime. And the human type that comes from a democracy is the fourth worst human type. Okay. Now, there's one regime worse than a democracy, and that's a tyranny. Okay. Now, what defines a tyranny? Well, a tyrant is what defines a tyranny. Um, we can even put in patriarchy as the worst regime. So tyranny, patriarchy, but it means the same thing. What's patriarchy? The rule archy of the father. But how does a father rule? How does a husband rule? His wife. Well, she's a slave. And you beat her. Okay. That's tyranny. All right. um, that, and that's why I have a hard time when we talk about... Um, I just taught um, a Genesis course. 
and uh, I spend an entire lecture on this, do not talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as patriarchs. That's bringing in a Greek concept, and that's a concept of tyranny. They're not patriarchs. It is not ruling your family with inhumane cruelty. That's what patriarchy means. Right? You rule your household, and you treat your wife and your slaves the same, because your wife is your slave, and you beat them. Um, actually, a book is just coming out, because up until the 40s, police weren't, would not respond to domestic violence calls, because it was your right as a husband to beat your wife. They wouldn't respond. No, you, you have that right. You can abuse her. Okay. So patriarchy is evil. So tyranny is the rule of the one, and what defines the one that has power is they rule with inhumane cruelty. Tyrants are always evil. All right. So you can see regimes are defined by right, the type of citizen it produces, or the type of human type that it produces. Now I want to go back to the second regime, because that's the one I want to focus on. So I gave you the five. The five are monarchy, along with aristocracy, that's number one. Number two is a timocracy. Number three is an oligarchy. What defines an oligarchy? Love of money, love of property, love of power. What defines a democracy? Love of freedom, love of equality. Okay. Now remember, for each regime, it produces a certain human type or a citizen. Politics is about citizens, and it is about producing citizens. Okay. And then, of course, there's the worst, which is a tyranny. But I want to go to timocracy. I think I've already given you enough hints. What is the greatest timocracy in history? Timocracy is the rule of one human type. And who is that human type? The ultimate warrior. And that's a Spartan. All right. So in history, <coughs> Sparta is the greatest regime. Greatest regime in history. In fact, Let's talk about number one, right? According to Socrates, the best regime is philosopher king and aristocracy, except what's the problem with that, Christina? Have we ever seen that? That's right, philosophers don't become king. Okay, that's a joke. So that regime actually is an impossibility. It's called a utopia. It's a beautiful idea, right? It inspires the imagination, <laughs> but it's a joke. It's never going to happen. So, what is the greatest regime, real regime in history? It is Sparta. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a little crash course on this regime, Sparta. I'm going to work off of Plutarch. Oh, how much time do I have? Uh, 8.50. Seven minutes, eight minutes. And I haven't even started my lecture. <laughs> 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 Let's go to seven. Go to seven. Oh, we can go to seven? Yeah. I mean, just remember that's an hour. This clock is an hour. Oh. It's 19 minutes. Go to, oh. Okay. Here's my actual lecture. Because <laughs> this is all background. Um, but that's okay. You know what? I had, I had fun doing it. Um, so you can talk to me after. But. So what I'm going to do right now is explain Sparta to you. So... Everyone, every political thinker in history always points back to Sparta as the best regime. Because if you're a citizen of Sparta, what are you? Spartan. Sparta produces Spartans. Okay, are we tracking? Rome produces Romans. Okay. Carthage produces Carthaginians. Athens produces Athenians. And Sparta produces Spartans. Uh, you seeing how this works? Whatever the regime is, it produces a certain human type, which we call a citizen. So if you're a citizen of Sparta, what are you? You're a Spartan. Well, what is a Spartan? And who came up with this regime? His name is Lycurgus. And I highly recommend, if you want to understand a Spartan, there are two sources. There is Plutarch. So Plutarch is... Um, a Platonist, he's a Greek thinker, and what he gives us are the lives of great military and political leaders, both for the Greeks and the Romans. Okay? So he has a list of Greek um, military and political leaders, founders, and he has a list of Roman. The very first leader he looks at 
is Lycurgus. Because Lycurgus is the founder of the greatest regime in history. So every political philosopher looks to Lycurgus as the greatest. He's the greatest founder because he produces the greatest regime, and this great regime is defined by its citizens, Spartans. Okay, so I'll give you a crash course on what Lycurgus does. So, uh, Lycurgus has an idea. He is going to create the ultimate regime. What's the first thing he needs to do? What's the one thing that will corrupt you every thing, single time? Money. Money is the root of all evil. All right. Jesus didn't only say that. Every philosopher says that. Philosopher, money is the root of all evil. So what does Lycurgus do? Gathers all the money in Sparta and burns it. Burns it. Okay. Then what does he take to, with all the gold and all the silver? Mixes it with lead. So he abolishes money. He abolishes gold and silver. Okay. So a Spartan can't go to Carthage, can't go over to Rome, can't go over to Athens and buy anything because they have no currency, no commerce. Okay. You want to create a regime like Sparta? No commerce. Okay. Which is unfortunate because what defines modern liberal democracies? Their democracy is defined by commerce. Okay. There's a lot of thinkers that would go, that will produce the worst human type, kind of like a Donald Trump human type. Oh, there you go. See, that's why I say the United States, they deserve Donald Trump as their president because that's the regime that produces that human type. Okay, because remember, whatever the regime is, that's the human type you're going to get. Okay, so what did Lycurgus do? Burns all the money, makes gold and silver useless, and then he abolishes all private property. So if you're a citizen of Sparta, do you have any money? No, because like Curtis burned it all. Do you have any gold or silver? Well, you've got this useless right, uh, mixture of lead and gold, so it's absolutely useless. Right? And do you own any property? No, nope, no property. And then he does something radical. Abolishes marriage and family. No marriage, no family. Right. So, <clears throat> what is the role of a woman? Remember, Sparta produces Spartans. And what is a Spartan woman's job? She has one job. Produce Spartans. All right. So, for the first time, we actually have the role of women kind of identified. Right? They have a job. They produce Spartans. Now, if you're a Spartan, do you have a family? No, you don't. Do you have a wife? No, you don't. What do you have? You have a barrack set up. So, what we did, or what Lycurgus did, he abolishes the household, he abolishes marriage and family, he abolishes money, gold, silver, property, and he puts every male in a barrack. And you live your entire life in a barrack. You eat together, you sleep together, you train together, and you fight together. Right. Now, what does their training look like? Does a Spartan get liberal arts education? Absolutely not. Okay? No history, no philosophy, no poetry, no literature, no theater, none of it. So Lycurgus removes all the liberal arts. No love of learning, no love of literature. Even Spartan dialogue is short and it's sweet. Don't waste time with words. Okay. Who's seen 300? Okay. That is historical. That's coming from Herodotus. Herodotus the historian. And so Spartans were famous. So Xerxes goes, I'm going to fight you tomorrow. I'm going to fire so many arrows at you, it's going to blanket the sun. It's going to darken the sun. Spartans go, good, we'll fight in the shade. That's their response. Okay. That's a Spartan. So the Spartan is this ultimate human type, and Lycurgus produces him. Okay. Because what defines a Spartan? What defines him? There's only one thing that defines him. Is he defined by his property? No, doesn't have any property. Is he defined by his right, um, investment portfolio? Does a Spartan have an investment portfolio? No, a Spartan does not have a family. What does a Spartan have? 
victory. And victory is a powerful, powerful thing. So these Spartans spend their entire life living in Barak. And their entire life is devoted to one thing, victory. And why do they love victory? Because glory and honor come from victory. And that is the prize. Glory and honor. Okay. What's more meaningful? Pursuing property, pursuing money, pursuing career, pursuing lifestyle, or pursuing victory? Victory trumps every single time because victory is powerful. So, what did Lycurgus do? Built a regime defined by one thing victory. Do Spartans lose? Spartans don't lose. Right. That's why I tell my Spartans that you go to nationals, if you don't come back with gold, don't come back. <laughs> no, that's Spartan. Right? You either come back, you either you come back with gold or you come back dead on your shield. Because what defines Spartan manliness? Well, two things. <laughs> Homosexuality. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'll quickly explain that. And <clears throat> love of violent death. What do you call a human type that fears violent death? They're called slaves. What do you call someone who doesn't fear violent death? They're masters. Okay. So, what Lycurgus was able to do is produce a regime that only produced one human type, the ultimate human type. And these human types don't lose. Okay. Because they're defined by one thing, victory. Now, I'm going to jump to Herodotus. So Herodotus tells the story of Leonidas and his 300 men. Now, Xerxes wants world empire. So Xerxes is the tyrant. And he has eros for power. He has eros for empire. He wants world empire. He controls the entire world. And he has a million-man army. But there's these two Greek cities that he doesn't possess. So he says, I'm going to go in and take them out. Now, what he did is he actually, and this wasn't part of the film, but if you read Herodotus, you'll hear this. So what Xerxes did is he hired a Greek, a Greek spy. So he hired him and says, okay, explain. Who are these Athenians and who are these Spartans? And the Greek spy says to him, Xerxes, you have no idea what you're about to encounter with these Spartans. These Spartans are the ultimate human types. They're the ultimate warrior. So he says, because uh, Xerxes goes, okay, I'm going to attack them. They know I'm coming, and they're going to meet me with 300? And so Xerxes feels humiliated. I've got a million-man army. Why are they coming at me with 300? And the spy says, well, because they're going to butcher you. Because those are 300 warriors, and you don't have any. Because that's what these men are trained to do. So, um, actually... I got seven minutes. I, I need to get back to the education of a Spartan. So, at the age of seven, mom lets him go. Right? Now, I know this is this is uh, um, well. It's just the Spartan way. Okay, the Spartan way. You're gonna understand the Spartan way here. Uh, do we actually call that around here? Do we call it the Spartan way? Hopefully we don't use that in our rhetoric because it means one thing. It means pederasty. So the seven-year-old is released from mom, and this seven-year-old needs to, right? So there's no one going to look after them. They're kind of orphaned. And they just kind of run around Sparta learning to steal and survive. That's it. Now, what ends up happening is they kind of get picked up by an adult Spartan, and that little boy becomes their lover. Okay. So their first sexual encounter is a homosexual encounter. And that's pederasty. Okay. Adult male, young boy. So that's their first encounter. And if they can survive to late teens, then they get bumped into um, the Spartan military class. And then they begin the training. Okay. Um, and so up in that point, um, they have um, real no concept of a mother and no concept of a female. Um, now, of course, a Spartan is going to need to produce citizens. And so on the night that they're going to meet a woman for the first time, she is presented to the Spartan in the dark with her hair cut short wearing boys' clothing. Because that's all they know. All right. Now, the idea behind this, um, I just finished in my Plato class, Plato's Symposium. And in Plato's Symposium, 
Um, there's a party, it's Agathon's party, there's six speeches, and each speech all praises, because these are Greeks, these are Athenians, they're all praising uh, the manliness that comes out of Sparta, Spartan manliness. And why they love Spartan manliness is because it produces courage. Manliness, courage, okay? Courage, you face your fear, and you don't run away as a coward, and you don't want run rashly into battle. You face your fear with courage. That's what defines a Spartan. Now, the way they can face their fear is because they have lovers on either side. Okay. So the idea behind Spartan military is go to military with your lover. And you, if you have your lover next to you, you're not going to do anything um, cowardly. Okay. Because you want to right, defend your lover and you're going to be courageous before your lover. And that's why I always joke with Spartans. That's why they always patting each other's bums. Okay. Um, well, I know. Yeah, whatever happens on the road stays on the road with you Spartans. All right. That's Spartan manliness. That's all right. As long as you come back with victory. All right. Um, okay. So then what defines a Spartan is <clears throat> training 24-7. Okay. A Spartan can't wait to go to battle because battle is easier than kind of training camp for battle because training camp is so brutal for them. All right. So they just can't wait. They're itching to get to war because war is actually easy for them. So back to Leonidas 300 and the hot gate. So Xerxes is traumatized by the fact that 300 Spartans are coming out to meet him. Who are these guys? What happens the first day? Leonidas, the 300, completely butcher Xerxes. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to stop here. Where else do you know about Xerxes? There's another famous book. It's actually a book within a book, and the book within the book is 66 books. Esther. The book of Esther, yeah. Same Xerxes. So I always go, who's a higher human type? How many Spartans did it take to stop Xerxes? Well, ultimately, did the 300 stop Xerxes? Well, slowed him down for three days. But by the time he got to Sparta, who was waiting at Sparta for Xerxes? 8,000 Spartans. So he couldn't handle 300 he didn't handle 8,000, and those 8,000 took him out. But then here's the question for you. How many Jews did it take to stop Xerxes? Same guy. One. Well, technically, one Jew and one Jewess, Mordecai and Esther. All right. So someone like Frederick Nietzsche would go, okay, Spartans are the ultimate human type, but in the Hebrew Bible, there's a higher human type, and they're called a Jew. All right. And they're kind of terrifying. So, Jews and Spartans, and then Romans, and then Carthaginians. It's kind of this ranking. All right. Okay. So, I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, but back to this concept of victory. Okay. So, what defined the Spartan? They're defined by only one thing. Victory. That's the only thing they possess. Wins. 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 So, this is what I do to Spartans who are in my class. <laughs> Remember Christina? Shearhorn? Shearhorn, you come back without a victory, you're not called a Spartan anymore. He gets called Princess Buttercup. <laughs> Remember from uh, the Princess Bride? All right. Hey, Princess Buttercup. Okay. How many times did he come back and I call him Princess Buttercup? All of a sudden, right, we got to change and we were coming back with gold, 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 gold. Okay, there we go. Gold's coming back. So, I, I do want to touch on gold, silver, bronze. That's coming from the Fable of the City. Christina, do you remember what book? Fable of the City? No, book three. Let me help you there. Book three of Plato's Republic. The Fable of the City, gold, silver, bronze. Now I want to touch on Sparta and Mount Olympus. Okay. Sparta, Athens, and Mount Olympus. Who gives us Mount Olympus? Homer does. So Mount Olympus is... The mountain of the gods. Okay. And which gods are on Mount Olympus? Well, they are the 12 gods that are the gods of the Greek world. So the gods of the Greek world look down on human beings and demand excellence. So what are the Olympic Games about? Competition. Who are the greatest? Because it is about victory. It's all about victory. Why do we go to war? 
victory. Why do we play sports? For one thing, you play for victory. You play for the sake of the game. That's why you play. And you play to win. You play for victory. Right. So what the Olympic Games reveal is who are the greatest. Because the greatest win gold. And if you're not gold, you're silver. Gold, number one. Silver, number two. Bronze, and then iron. Remember, Christina, what's iron? Farmers. What's bronze? Craftsmen. And who are the guardians? The warriors. They're the gold and the silver. All right. That's why I let um, the ladies volleyball team back into my class. Silver, you're still guardian. You're still mil You can still come back in. All right. Okay. So, <clears throat> what we have is the world of superheroes. Spartans are superheroes. What is Olympic Games about? Who are the superheroes? And, right, these Greeks were all about. Again, when you hear the word Superman or superhero, um, it's, you're, you're thinking DC comic. Don't think like that. So, you have man, right, like the product of a democracy, right? Man, and then you've got a superman. The best regimes produce supermen, superheroes, and the ultimate is Sparta. Now, I just want to quickly talk about uh, another Greek. His name's Alcibiades. Now, he's not a Spartan, oh, but he loved Sparta. In fact, his mother hired a Spartan wet nurse to raise him. Because Spartan gym and Spartan diet is very simple. Okay. So what is Spartan diet? Soup. And it's the same thing every single day. Now, why soup? What does the Spartan body look like? It's lean and it's mean. Right. And then gymnasium. Right. Simple gymnasium and simple diet. And it produces these ultimate bodies and these ultimate human types. Now, I want to touch on Alcibiades because Alcibiades, like everyone, loved Sparta. And he goes to the Olympic Games. And what defines Alcibiades is Alcibiades, he loves victory. Because with it comes glory and honor. And I love telling this story. So, when Alcibiades goes to the Olympic Games, right, he brings chariots, because he's going to race chariots. That's his event in the Olympic Games. But this is what he does. He buys every horse and every chariot. He owns every... So, every horse and chariot that's in the race, he owns. So, what does he win? He wins first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. All positions, he wins. Right? So, he's famous in the Olympic Games because right, no one defeats him because he won. <laughs> and I love it. Yeah, Alcibiades. It, it is, again, it is about victory. That's what it's about. Because victory identifies human types, the highest human types. And so what were the games about? It's not about war, but war and game is for a reason. Why do we go to war? To win? And why do we play games? Why do we play sports? What, for sportsmanship? See, I was even telling them. I go, if you can deflate a football, deflate the football. Okay, <laughs> uh, and I have the whole you know philosophy of cheating in sport, right? If you can get away with it, all right. If the ref doesn't see it, what you're gonna what? Give yourself? Oh, ref, you didn't see, but hey, uh, I fouled this guy, so right, give him right two foul shots. No, you don't do that. All right, uh, but I've run out of time, so thank you for having me this evening. Um, have a wonderful time going to the Olympics, right?